In this video, I'm going to spend the next 10 minutes uh, showing you how to set up your computer as well as iTools to be able to communicate with a Eurotherm product such as the VersaDAC. Now the VersaDAC, which is what I have on my desk right now, is a blind data acquisition unit. But a lot of our other devices such as a NanoDAC 3504, the ePower controller, and many other devices have native Modbus TCP IP connections, meaning you can connect a RJ45 from the device I'll plug it into your computer, into a switch, and be able to use iTools to communicate to it. If you have that capability, then you can upload and download configurations, uh, monitor process variables, and a lot of other really interesting things you can do uh, with iTools. Now, being able to do this is all dependent on the application. If you've got the device sitting on your desk, it makes it very straightforward. Um, but if this is installed in a process, uh, naturally, you need to have the ability to be able to communicate to it. So you may need to get your IT in, uh, department involved. Um, but assuming that you do have this connected to a network or or it is sitting on your desk, there's a couple different things that we need to do to set up um, our computer from a hardware and software perspective to be able to talk to it. From a hardware perspective, we need, need to be able to make our computer communicate with the IP address of the device uh, Eurotherm product here. Now out of the box, Eurotherm has an as the default IP address of 192.168.111.222. That is an internal IP address. Chances are something that you're not utilizing within your own uh, network. So what I want to do uh, for my particular setup is I'm going to take my uh, laptop that has two NICs in it. Uh, a wireless NIC as well as a wire NIC. I want to keep my wireless NIC as my WAN connection or my connection to the internet and then use my wired connection as my LAN connection or my local area network. So the first thing that I want to do is be able to make my computer communicate to the same subnet that the VersaDAC is on. So what I would do is go to control panel and click on network connections. Right now you can see that uh, my local area connection is connected to my home network. So I can right click, hit properties, go down to where it says IPv4, hit properties, and chances are this is probably how you have your uh, wire connection set up. If you change this down to use the following IP address, this will give us the ability to assign our wired connection an IP within the same subnet as the VersaDAC. To be in the same subnet, the first three octets need to be 192.168.111, and then the last octet can be anywhere from 1 to 255, but it cannot be 222 because that would be the same IP address of the device. So to keep it simple, I'm going to go ahead and just give it an IP address of uh, .100. If you hit tab, it automatically populates the subnet mask. Um, you don't need to worry about putting anything into the default gateway because that's only used when your packet has to leave the subnet. It needs to be routed somewhere else, and we're not doing that. So we can go ahead and leave that blank. Once we do that, we can hit, go ahead and hit OK and hit Close. Uh, you'll notice it changes from CNET to Unidentified Network because... Really, it's only two devices on this network. Um, and from a hardware perspective, that's it. Pretty straightforward. Um, again, everybody's configuration is going to be different. Uh, this is assuming you're using a laptop. Also, keep in mind, when I set mine up, I actually had to go into the BIOS and tell my computer to use both the wired and wireless connections simultaneously. Never had to do that before. Um, there are some methods to do that via software to do it within your control panel, but that didn't work for me. The only way I could get my computer to use wired and wireless was going through the BIOS. So if you happen to set this up, you've got a wireless connection, and then you plug in your wired, and it takes over, meaning you can't use wireless, check your BIOS settings and make sure there's not something you have to set up in there. Uh, to verify that we can communicate to the di device, let's go ahead and open up a command prompt. Uh, in Windows 7, you can do that by just typing CMD uh, underneath the Start menu. Uh, there's a search box. And let's go ahead and type in ping 192.168.111.222 and hit Enter. Um, it looks like it can communicate. That's a good sign. So again, from a hardware perspective, that's it. Pretty straightforward. Let's go ahead and close that window out and we'll just minimize this. Now, from a software side of things, we need to tell iTools how to scan for the device. There's two ways to do this, um, and it's really based on preference. The first way is through the control panel. So if we go ahead and bring up a new control panel, there's an icon once uh, iTools is installed, and it puts into your control panel called iTools 32-bit. 
If we click on it, you'll get a pop-up. Just go ahead and hit yes. It's to do with the user access controls. I'll bring this window over. And then what we want to look at is the TCP IP tab. Now here is where we can add various uh, IP addresses so that iTools knows what to scan for on the network. Uh, when you're using something like a serial connection or a configuration clip, this is already done for you. You don't need to do this, but because you can have multiple IP addresses, you need to specify this. This is going to be a one-time thing. It's a one-time setup. Once you do this, you won't have to do it again unless you add another IP address. So what I say, what I mean by this is after you configure um, and, and perhaps you have a, um, you know, industrial uh, subnet, uh, you may change it from 192 to, to something else. If that's the case and your computer's also on it and you can communicate to it, uh, you can change the IP here or, or add the IP so that when you scan for it, it knows how to find it. But again, this is very straightforward. It's just a matter of, of clicking a couple icons and adding the IP address. So on the TCP uh, tab, go ahead and click on add. Now the name, I would uh, suggest using something very general because some train of thought thinks that it's smart to give it a name here, but when it identifies the device after it's done scanning, it actually tells you what the device is and part of the identification, identification string. Furthermore, I'm using a VersaDAC right now, but I could easily connect a NanoDAC with the same default IP address, not at the same time, but at another time uh, down the road. And I don't want to necessarily name this VersaDAC if I'm loading an anodac, if that makes sense. So I'm just gonna go ahead and call this device one. You can, again, name it whatever you want. It's just your way of identifying what the device is. You can go ahead and leave the connection time uh, type and timeout as is. Go down to where it says add and put in the IP address. So I put in the default IP address, the port and the block read. Once you've got that set up, go ahead and hit okay. And now you'll see that device one has a connection type of Modbus TCP with the following IP address. Once you're done, go ahead and apply and OK. That's it. Now, the other way to do this, and it's a little bit um, more granular, it has a little bit more um, options for configuration, is to actually look at the OPC server. So if you don't prefer to do that method, within iTools, you can go down to where it says Options, Advanced, so show server. I'm going to go ahead and bring this over. Now, this is your OPC server. This is actually what's doing the communicating between um, the device and iTools. Um, as you can see, it already has the device here that we just created through um, the control panel. But if you wanted to add a device here, you can go to add. Uh, sorry, go ahead and click on net, uh, new TCP network port. And same kind of concept. Uh, we can, you know, I'll just device two. Leave this uh, as default, add TCP host details, same concept, put the IP address in here. And when you put in the IP address, you can then hit uh, connect and the status should uh, change to, you know, it's, it's able to communicate to it. So it actually gives you indication of if it's able to communicate to it or not. Um, if you do this method, that's perfectly fine. Again, it's completely up to you what way uh, it feels more comfortable. Um, but once you're done, go ahead and hit OK. It will show up down here and hit OK. But again, I'm not adding a device this, this way. It's just another method to, to do it. Um, if you do use OPC server uh, to set it up this way, my suggestion to you is to make sure we go in and save as. And then you can uh, label this whatever this is. And the reason is, is when you add a uh, device to OPC, you need to make sure that it is looking at this particular configuration. Um, and then you also give a, another option for it to, to use this every time and go ahead and click OK. Uh, that way you can have different types of OPC server configurations uh, depending on the application. Um, but one thing to take away from this is just make sure that when you are done looking at the screen, don't hit the X. Just go ahead and close out. So go ahead and hit View, Hide Server. If you do exit out, it's going to pause for about five to seven seconds. And then it's going to give you a warning saying if you close out, they won't be able to communicate. And you have to restart iTools, and it's just more troublesome than it's worth.
you can go ahead and leave it as the first item, scan all devices. My suggestion to you is if you only have one device, go ahead and click on terminate scan when the first device is found. If you don't do this, the scan will continue to run and you'll notice a slight performance degradation. Keep that in mind, it's not gonna hurt, it's just gonna slow things down a little bit. This will terminate the scan once the first device is found. I'll go ahead and hit okay. Uh, what you'll notice down at the bottom, it says scanning 255. So when it says that, it's looking at all the TCP IP devices before it looks at serial-based devices. They may have connected, maybe via configuration clip, etc. cetera. Um, this process is completely dependent on the product that you're looking at. Um, also, if it's the first time that you've looked at the product through iTools, uh, since your computer's booted versus maybe a second time. So this is the first time that I've looked at it on this boot. So what it's doing is, is it's, it sees something out there, it's grabbing all the information, um, configuring it, and then it'll display on my computer. Takes maybe about 15, 20 seconds for the first time to scan. As you can see, it's, it's found the device, it says it was synchronizing, and now it's found. Uh, we're live. So from here, um, then we can go through the rest of iTools and use any of the configuration parameters to set up the device that we want to. I won't be covering that in this particular uh, uh, tutorial, but I did want to show how you can use uh, just a standard connection on your computer and the device and use iTools to communicate. Once you're done with the device, feel free to hit remove or you can just exit out of the device. It's the same concept. Um, hope you enjoyed. And I'll have a lot more videos coming up in the very near future. Thanks again.